Hi, Ola. Thanks for joining me here on the Need to Know Co Comedy Show. Um, so I think you're, you've been busy. I mean, you're actually working during this lockdown. I am, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm a clinical pharmacist, so I work at hospital. Um, so, have time. And is it like, is it tough now with the, with the coronavirus? Or does that affect you? Um, it's, it's a lot busier than what we're used to. Um, I caught Corona, uh, whilst working. So oh, really? yeah, yeah. I was off sick for like three weeks. Um, I worked on a COVID ward. So, um, I caught it. Don't know. It could be off a patient, could be off stuff. have no idea, but at least now I've got antibodies. So if anybody needs any plasma, call me up. <laughs> and how, well, how long were you off then? Was I think I was off for about three weeks. I think it was about three weeks. It really hit me hard, like proper hit me hard. But uh, yeah, bounced back and back to normal. Yeah. So it's a, it is pretty bad. It's a bad dose. <laughs> Obviously. Oh, is. yeah, 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 yeah. Like oh, some people are um, asymptomatic. So some people get it and they don't feel anything. And then some yeah. people get it and they feel really bad. And then some people get it and they pass. So wash your hands, yeah. wear a mask. Yes indeed we should all be doing that yeah. <laughs> um although there's all these lunatics online now who are like kind of going i'm not gonna you know it's like we've been told what to do by the government it's a big plan to um oh i don't know that bill gates is all behind it such rubbish it really annoys me yeah people people always the thing is you you will never know everything like you wouldn't so could conspiracies be right yeah yeah i know obviously you never know everything yeah i mean if you watch the matrix you could believe that we're all living in a dream and it's exactly all actually just lying in a little plasma thing um, <laughs> <We could but>. <laughs> <laughs> so um so tell me when did you when did you start uh, like did you have an interest in comedy when you were when you were growing up or like, yeah, I've always been interested in comedy. Um, I always tell people that my dad was always the biggest joker, was always the center of attention, was always the funny one. And I've always really enjoyed it. And the prospect of being able to make people laugh and have a career out of it has always appealed to me. But um, I come from a religious East African background. So growing up, we only ever had three choices to be a doctor, to be a pharmacist, or to be an engineer. And you couldn't skew outside of those three things. So I ended up doing pharmacy. And when I hit 30, I had like my third life crisis. And I thought, if I don't do comedy, I'll never do it. Mm -hmm. So went to an open mic night in a grubby little pub in North Manchester. And it kind of just went from there, really. Right, yeah. And uh, straight off, do you know what kind of, do you remember what material you were doing like the first time? Oh, it was so whack. Like when I, co when I go back and I think about it, I was like, why did people even laugh at me? Why did they encourage me? Um, I can't even, what did I talk about? I think, do you know what? There's not a lot of uh, like female Muslim comedians out there, especially practicing ones. So there wasn't really a lot like I could look up to to see what kind of things they did so I think I thankfully at the beginning I was in a bubble where I s spoke about like being a Muslim and wearing a hijab and it, I I didn't what I don't want my comedy to, to be just about that it's like that's not who I am obviously it's part of who I am but it's not entirely who I am but I think what was my joke I can't even remember did I make a Harry Potter joke I think I spoke about Harry Potter I think I must have mentioned Harry Potter not because of the glasses it, it I said uh I can't even bloody remember can you mind it, it, it must right. have been that bad <laughs> <laughs> sorry no but I mean I suppose you have to refer to the hijab you can't just go on I guess you've got to kind of refer to it I yeah yeah I did you know what it's really funny because with all this like talk about like harassment in the comedy circuit and there was one joke that I made about the hijab and it was about how people underestimated 
like girls who wear it and how people perceive us to be like modest and oppressed and you know we don't want to speak to men so I make comments about like how the hijab was not only a spiritual barrier but also a physical barrier to keep all the dirt that swims around in our head that we're actually very very nasty nasty girls and we need this to lock us down so I make a joke about how the hijab should be called a hojab instead <laughs> and so it, I thought it went well or whatever, but my God, the messages that I got after that, I thought, you know, I'm never going to say that. People were like, oh, you've made us really curious. We're definitely going to approach um, girls with hijabs more often now. <laughs> and one guy was like, I'm really, he was like, I'd love to see you naked, but just with your hijab on. And I was getting literally the craziest messages. So I scrapped that joke because I was like, I'm not risking that ever again. So um, it's taught me to be more selective with yeah, what I God, say. Yeah, my God, that's unbelievable. So they, they were men taking that very seriously. Yeah, well, I don't even know if it was seriously, but I, I think I definitely sparked some curiosities out there. Maybe I've, like, started a new fetish. I should get, you, I should get money for that. <laughs> well, it's probably similar to the, the uh, Catholic fetish for nuns, you know, just like... Yeah, I could the be idea. like the nun version. Yeah, I could be the Muslim version. Yeah, let's work together. We can do something with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we could do a you could do a, a Muslim Father Ted type show, you know. <laughs> yeah, I could, you know. <laughs> All right, and uh, so 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 uh, straight off, did you did you um, start hitting the circuit like on a regular basis? Oh yeah, so when I did that first gig, there was a promoter there, like a, just a small time promoter who had like two gigs going. So he asked me to perform at his gigs and then somebody else saw me and then the word went round. So no joke, within like three, four weeks, I was doing three or four gigs a night. Not like massive ones, but like everywhere. I was going to Manchester, cause I was in the Northwest at the time. So I was gigging in Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, some places that I didn't even know the name of. So I think it was more of a curiosity thing because even the first time when I went to the first open mic, um, it's called, it was a, in a place called the Comedy Balloon and I went inside and the security guard was like, are you okay there, love? Um, are you lost? And I was like, I don't think so. Is this the Comedy Balloon night? And he was like, uh, yeah, uh, straight up. So, and I could tell by his face, it's like, you know, no one, he, they probably never seen a hijabi Muslim girl come into a pub before. So I think like, that's what kind of sparks off a lot of people's um, curiosity. And uh, yeah, I think it was more like, you know, what the hell could possibly come out of her mouth. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite blessed to say All that right, yeah. it did kick off quite quite well in a short period of time yeah 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 but obviously there's that uh, element that that you're uh, wearing the hijab and people are are like find that unusual but i mean you're genuinely funny i mean you you it, it wouldn't really work if you weren't funny so. well i'd like to think that so I, I think like initially it is curiosity but um like i always say that i work very hard and the thing is um even though i started doing comedy at 30 um, I've always been writing, I've always been watching, I've always been, you know, so I've always been working on it. It's not like, you know, I just sprung out of nowhere and here we go. Um, like I've, I've been writing for a really long time and I did well, but people do kind of throw the whole, oh, she's doing well because she's a niche, because there's no one like her. And that pisses me off. Um, but like people don't... Um, kind of see that there a lot of work went on behind it there's a there are hijabi girls that are doing comedy and you know they're not all is that rude to say i don't know is it oh, I'm not sure. they're not, not all famous well i don't know i haven't personally gone to see them i will always support my own if they're funny you have to be very careful what you say here now. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying, if it was about niche, then every niche person would do it and like be big. But 
it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of writing, a lot of uh, watching other people's material, reading other people's material, getting inspiration and putting things together. Because if you're worried, and I get this a lot, it's because I'm white and I'm male. That's why I can't make it. I am more than happy to give you a Quran. I'm more than happy to donate you a hijab. And if you think that's what's going to get you on the market, then please come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, it's, it's the way it is with comedy. Uh, no matter what, what you do, even if you're big and famous and, and I have done some, I don't know, sitcom, with, if you're not funny in the first five minutes, it, you know, there's a big kind of wow factor even for famous people, right? For five minutes. But then if they're not funny. Then you're not funny. So I did the uh, Frog and Bucket, the Beat the Frog. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I used to do the Frog and Bucket years ago. I don't know, is Beat the Frog a, a uh, competition? It's a gong show. So basically you have to impress within five minutes and at any point they can like, press, like they'll pick three people from the audience, they pick up a red card and if you're whack, they'll put up the red cards and if you get three red cards, they gong you off. And the whole purpose of this is to show you that the first five minutes of your comedy is so crucial that you have to kind of get people's attention like within five minutes. And if you don't, then so if you can get the first five minutes, that means, you know, you've got, you're worth listening to regardless of, you know, what you look like or this or that or this or that, Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's very important. The first five minutes, I think even the first 30 seconds, the first, when you just come on are so important. If you screw that up, it's very, you spend the next half hour trying to, trying to get the back, you know, it's very important. Same, yeah, of same course. as meeting people, just meeting people for the first time. First thir you make your decision probably in the first 30 seconds. So, yeah, and that's exactly what it is, isn't it? You are meeting someone, you're kind of, you're kind of like deciding whether you want to listen to this person or not. And I think you can kind of know that quite quickly, I think. Oh, opinion. I think so. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you pick up physical kind of cues from people. We don't really A know vibe. it's all subconscious, but yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, so what's your father thing now? So your father's like, was, is quite funny, is it? Would he always be kind of... My dad is hilarious. Like he is literally, literally, literally hilarious. Um, I don't tell him I'm a comedian because in their head, a comedian is someone that wears a colorful wig and a big red nose. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's what they think they do. Like, um, like where I come from, like comedians aren't articulate, you know, they, uh, the words in Sudanese is awara. They 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 just do stupid things. Like they talk stupid and they act stupid. But they it's not like comedy here. Like comedy here in some cases is quite intelligent. Like you're telling stories, you're raising awareness, doing it in a humorous way to educate people and make them laugh at the same time. So because they don't watch English comedy or American comedy or whatever in their head that's the concept of comedy so my dad saw me perform at a culture for uh, at the culture forum in london and um i was doing comedy but from what he was seeing it was just hosting but being funny so i've just stuck to that i'll tell him i'm a host with a humorous twist <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I i know that even in eastern europe maybe it's changing now but their idea of comedy is funny guy you know funny clown type people yeah yeah and i'd like to think that's not what i'm like i'd like to think that you definitely are yeah. <laughs> <You're very bad. laughs> um yeah but i watched a couple of things you've done online so uh, with obviously with the lockdown you kind of have to go online and and do mm. a, a couple of rants i've watched which are quite funny as well and uh, <laughs> uh is that something that you feel like you have to do now? Is kind of is it something that you're comfortable with doing online comedy? Um, I think it's you kind of 
got no choice. I know it sounds really bad, but obviously if I had a choice between live comedy and online comedy, I'd go for live comedy in a heartbeat. But at the end of the day, you've got to utilize what um, materials you have. You've got to utilize what platforms you have and make the most of the situation that you're in. Um, but I obviously much prefer to perform in front of a live audience because you've kind of got that ambiance and you've got that you know that vibe and you're like connecting with people and stuff like that but you know you gotta do what you gotta do yeah i know we've got to got to wait and hope there's a vaccine and we'll all be back yeah again <laughs> um and so how do you see your like would you like to do a something outside of stand-up uh you know acting or um Oh yeah, Churches. like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm open to anything. Um, so I did a bit of because uh, part of my comedy is acting, you know, like imitating people. Uh, so like I feel that there is a lot of acting in comedy in itself. But yeah, I would love to get into that. I'd love to get into film or sketches or um, you know. Yeah, it's something I'm very, very, very open to. So hopefully in the near future, you might see me pop up somewhere. <laughs> I'd say you'd be brilliant, to be honest. Yeah. Thank You've you. Got that. You know, some, some stand-ups you go, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're just stand-ups. But some people, you know, they have that personality to be able to, to do different characters. And uh, I suppose like you kind of act out your comedy even on stage. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, because I'm not just talking from, like about me. Sometimes I'll be like talking about an experience where I spoke to someone and something that he did and I'd have to get into the character of that person and you're like flipping from one thing to another. So um, that in itself, I think, can be difficult because you're literally jumping from one person to the other. It's not like I speak somebody. So like, for example, if I went, oh, I went into the shop and the shopkeeper said, can you give me 50p? That's me talking, but like, I'm the kind of person where I wouldn't do that. I'll be like, I went into the shop and the shopkeeper went, oi, give me 50p, for example. <laughs> that was such a shit example. So bad, but for example. So like, you know what I mean? So like, I kind of like talk out the character rather than just word the character. That I'm yeah, yeah, about. yeah. I know what you mean though. Yeah, act out. Yeah, and uh, yeah. uh, you're... Your uh, stand up, yeah, no, that's cool. So, do you think, like, are, are you uh, at what point would you say, I'm going to do this full time? Because you'd have to give up like an, a fairly good career at any time. The second <laughs> I can pay my rent, uh, pay my bills, uh, pay my car insurance, pay my phone, I will drop it like really. Yeah. I'll keep registered just in case I get broke and I have to do some shifts. But yeah, comedy's my life. The thing is, people are like, oh, you save lives. Why would you do comedy if you're saving lives? Comedy, you save lives. You make people laugh. Just like, you know, you're, you're helping people be happy rather than be alive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, incredibly important. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And at the end of the day, it's like what you're passionate about. I'm not saying I'm, you know, I, my, it's a very rewarding job what I do, but it's not what I see. My, it's not, it's not what like I can wake up in the morning and be like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. Like, this is my life. Like, this is something that I would never, like, if you, if, if I would not have thought four years ago that I would be having a conversation like this, let's put it this way. So for me, it's like what drives me to work hard, what drives me to like excel and that's comedy. So if another pharmacist wants to judge me, judge away. <laughs> and and uh, are you, uh, have you ever had any negative kind of blowback for, from uh, the Islamic community for, for doing what you're doing uh, well, I, I, I did one Islamic event uh, probably the last one I'll ever do um, but I think they just <laughs> didn't get it it was very it was one of the most probably the worst experiences of my life and I had a um, 
I've had abscesses in horrible places, but that performance in front of an Islamic community was worse than that experience. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, it's tough when you, yeah. We've all had them. Every comedian's had the, the uh, it's like corporate gigs, you know, where they're just too stuffy. I find if you get a corporate gig, for some reason, people uh, don't want to hear rude words because they're at a corporate gig and their boss is watching them and they don't want to see, be seen to be laugh, laughing at something that might be a bit rude. Yeah, so I did, so in a nutshell, I didn't know it was an Islamic event. I got contacted by Manchester University and they said they have an event and they want me to perform. And it was during Ramadan. So I didn't know it was an Islamic event. A week before, I found out that a few people had backed out. So I was like, why have so many, like the musician had back, back, backed out, the singer had backed out. And I was like, what's going on? And they were like, oh, they said it's not suited for them. And I was like, why, what, what about it is not suited for them? Um, so eventually, a few days before, I got a contract and it said, no um, sexual references, no swear words, basically, no um, political uh, whatever. And I kind of looked at the contract and I was like, so they basically want me to get on stage and stay silent because this is my whole set. Um, so I messaged them and I was like, look, I can't stick to this. Um, it's, I can't, it's not my vibe, it's not my this, not my that. P.S. Are you sure? This is an, it's not an Islamic event. And they were like, no, it's not. And you know what? This is just a formal thing. Just come in, blah, blah, blah. I came in to this place. I walk in and it's segregated. Men on one side, border, women on the other side. And all the women were like covered up, like very, said if you were herby looking. And I thought, what? did I just walk into I get given like a flyer with the um performances of the day and it was like speaker one how to repent your sins speaker two how to the easiest path into paradise speaker three how to like be wholesome during ramadan speaker four oh little bib and I just thought oh my god so i went straight to the organizer that was there and i was like look this is not my vibe this this is an islamic event i was like i cannot do it and she was like oh please you know this and that and this and that and this and that so do you know what i just got my notebook and i just started scribbling out anything that i thought could possibly offend any of these people bearing in mind i am one of them but i but it looked very 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 orthodox so I got on stage and I thought, you know what, my Jeremy Carl joke, very easy, nothing rude. It's all about how my mum didn't speak a lot of English, but then she started watching the Jeremy Carl show and started picking up English from them. So I started speaking like them, basically. And I thought that's something people can relate to. So I was like, oh, you know, we're all upset that the Jeremy Carl show got cancelled. Who's upset that the Jeremy Carl show got cancelled? And everybody's just looking at me like, and I was like, do any of you know who Jeremy Carl is? silence and I thought oh shit I've got a lot to work with and I thought you know what Game of Thrones who doesn't watch Game of Thrones I personally don't but according to British statistics only like 10% of people under the age of 18 don't watch Game of Thrones so I was like oh this 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 Game of Thrones who watches Game of Thrones silence nobody answered so at this point I was getting pissed off like it was really irritating me and I was like, are you telling me in this room of 300 people, no one's ever watched Game of Thrones? I could see people looking at each other. And at that point, I lost the plot. I was like, look, guys, I didn't want to have to call this, but this is the holy month of Ramadan. And one of the worst things you can do during the holy month of Ramadan is lie. So I will ask this one more time. And God is witnessing this. Who in this room watches Game of Thrones? One Somali guy at the front was like, I was like, why are you looking so sad? I said, you're not going to go to hell for watching Game of Thrones. And then everybody was like looking at him like really judgingly. And I was like, you know what? I came here to tell a couple of jokes, but the only joke is <laughs> the fact that I'm here. So enjoy your evenings and God give you all the blessings. I put my mic down and I left. And she was like, you haven't completed your set. I was like, don't give me the money. 
I don't want it. Donate it to whatever fund you've got going here. But that was my worst gig ever. <laughs> I'll tell you why. It's a funny story, though. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still, I'm still trying to get over it. To be honest, people are like, "Oh, what are you talking about?" I was like, "I'm still trying to get over it. Once I'm over it, I'll fully talk about it." <laughs> No, it, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's worth experiencing that for the for the hilarious story. Yeah, maybe. Um, do you feel devastated after something like that? Like, are you going home going, oh, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know. I think I think the only thing that annoyed me was the fact that I asked and I was misinformed. I think that annoyed me. Um, mm. I get why they wouldn't find it funny. Like if I was in their shoes, if I went to an Islamic event and then they got a comedian, I would probably appreciate it because me, but then if I was with my parents, for example, for example, I can kind of, I could, I'd cringe on their behalf. Do you know what I mean? And there were people who were of older ages and stuff like that. So I was embarrassed and I felt awkward. But at the end of the day, I, perform to weird and weird and wonderful people. So for me, I just see it as a challenge. Like I can make anybody laugh. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, found out later that about 40% of the audience didn't even speak English. They probably had no idea what I was saying anyways. So it was kind of a lose-lose situation. Yeah, yeah. And I understand what you mean. Like uh, you don't want to, you don't want an older lady or a man to, to uh, I've been in situations, say, like, like I'm doing a gig in a small village in Ireland and the whole village are there. And then I start into something that's about religion. And then I just ask, you know, and then I see this old lady kind of going, oh, I don't want to hear this. And I go, oh, maybe I should just steer away from it. I don't want to ruin her evening. Do you know what I mean? Oh, but the Irish have such a great... I love do. performing for, like, an Irish. They've got such an amazing sense of humour. They're always like ready to laugh and ready to have fun. I don't know if I'm just very generalized and like proper generalizing here, but um, do you know what? I'm going, I'll, I'll get you down to do the next Ramadan event. How about that? I'll put your name forward. I'll do that. And you can come over to Ireland and, and do a, a gig around Easter. <laughs> Easter <time>. <laughs> <laughs> and they love that. Sounds so, like a fair trade. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you should come out to Ireland and do gigs so sometime um, yeah I'd love to yeah I think you'd love it over here people are quite friendly um, so I, uh, I when I contacted you I, 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 I let you know that at the at the end of this chat I'm going to ask you for to re recommend an act that maybe I haven't heard of, or, or anyone that's watching hasn't heard of, that you reckon is really good. So have you thought about that? Yeah, I've had a thing. So um, I started off at the comedy set, like from scratch. So I thought of all the people that I've watched during my journey who have had the same journey as me. And there's one guy called Silham who I found really, and I find really, really funny because uh, number one, he was born with this like, voice thing so his voice is always hoarse so he sounds like he's smoked like 60 cigars um and that that obviously had me going from the beginning because he talks about it and um he's like an asian guy your typical asian guy that's come from bradford and he talks about that as well and how his parents and like i just related to him so much because his he talks about because he was raised by his grandparents and he just talks about it. it's just he's just he really makes me laugh so maybe that's one to um oh yeah what's, look at. what's his name what's his name silham shazam shilham uh, si sorry sorry shilham sh shazam yeah yeah I'll, I'll i'll send you his at uh on ig oh yeah brilliant thanks a lot so uh he'll be fun to talk to oh that'd be fantastic uh yeah and thanks for coming on and and uh what what's what are you planning for the future now in comedy? How do you see things going? Um, I'm hoping, well, people, there's a lot of outdoor comedy and stuff like that, but my mentality is, mate, if you've opened pubs and restaurants, why haven't you opened comedy clubs? Like, I just don't understand the concept. I went to um, 
a restaurant uh, about three, four days ago, and it was, it was packed. Like it was honestly packed. And I felt like when I go to see comedy, I have a lot more space around me than I did then. And there's people like eating and talking. So not only are, is COVID coming out of their mouth, COVID's attaching to food particles that are spraying out anyways. So it's probably more risk. So I just think it's about time they um, sort it out. I um, did the gig for the Frog and Bucket, uh, the first post lockdown gig. And I just thought it was beautifully organized, beautifully done, social distancing, everything so i I'm, I'm hoping based on the pilot after this two week uh period that hopefully things will go back to normal really i'm hoping yeah, yeah i'm doing my first live gig in about five months tonight actually so oh um, but, social distanced or just like back to normal it's outdoors in a garden uh, uh, and uh, so it's outdoor that's okay uh but you know the weird thing about it is i'm like really nervous because kind of almost forgotten how to do a live gig <laughs> so yeah 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 yeah. it's so nerve-wracking so that was my first one like that in months and it just watch your stuff back but i was proper i was hacking it big time but you'll be fine you're a funny guy people know who you are so yeah, no, I'll be okay. I'm going to look at, at uh, some of my stuff back just to remind myself um, h- how I do it. So yeah, um, just enjoy it, enjoy it. And the se- like within, I, I'd say within like five seconds of being up there, it was just like made me realise literally how much I miss it, and just make the most of it because you don't know when if you know things will they will decide. Oh, actually, no, we don't want it anymore. Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, just make the most of it. It'll be so much fun. Yeah. I'm jealous. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know what's going to happen during the winter. It's probably going to lock down again. But um, listen, it's not. been really nice chatting to you. Your stuff is amazing. Oh, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really good. And the stuff you're doing on, on um, online as well is hilarious. So, oh, thanks, Joe. Thank you. So, oh, well, yeah, thanks a lot. Have a... A good day. Thanks for coming on the Need to Know Comedy Show and um, uh, good luck with the, the rest of your career if I never see you again. <laughs> oh no, you'll definitely see me again. Thank you for having me and I will definitely be seeing you around. I'll definitely see you, yeah. All right, bye-bye. Ola. Okay, see you later. Take care.